Dr. Sarah Phoenix is an assistant professor of French at Brigham Young University. She is a Global Women's Studies affiliate and currently serves on the Global Women's Studies Executive Committee at BYU. She received her bachelor's degree in English and French from Brigham Young University and was one of the first students to graduate with a minor in Women's Studies. She received a master's in French from BYU and earned her PhD from the University of Pennsylvania. She started teaching at BYU in 2014 and has taught a variety of French and, global and gender studies classes. Her research on 19th century French studies has been published in many journals, including 19th century French studies, Romance Notes, and Dies Neuf. In 2017, Dr. Phoenix won the Lawrence Scher Memorial Prize for her research. Her current research on killer corsets in 19th century France will be published in a publication of Dies Neuf. While she has always had a love for French culture, Dr. Phoenix got her love and fascination for the corset and its role in reproductive politics originally from the short story, Novel in a Corset, by Maupassant. Her research has allowed her to dive into the macabre and political realm of reproduction politics and stigmas of 19th century France. She has found that her research helps her to expand the way she sees her life as a woman in, in the 21st century. When she is not in the classroom, she, en she enjoys taking hikes with her dog and watching scary movies. Talking about her research, Dr. Phoenix said, if we don't have these conversations, then the very worst impulses among us win, and people are deprived of opportunities to teach and to learn. Her fascination with the corset and 19th century French fashion has led her to the topic of her presentation today, killer corsets and heavy metal, fashion and reproductive politics in 19th century France. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Sarah Phoenix to our colloquium today. Well, thank you for coming and thank you to everyone who helped organize this and made this possible. Um, so my research, this is very much representative of the, the book project that I'm working on. And like most people, I am fascinated by beauty. But maybe unlike most people, uh, I am more fascinated by the monsters that these beautiful things create. And I like to say that my research uh, lives kind of at the intersection of couture and creepy. Um, and so we'll be talking about La Belle Époque, the period in French history at the end of the 19th century and up through the beginning, <coughs> excuse me, of the 20th. Um, but I thought, well, maybe it's more appropriate to call it the Annabelle Époque, <laughs> um, something that represents this juncture of these two things, right? Something that's supposed to be beautiful and feminine, but is deeply unsettling. So. In 19, excuse me, in 2017, Jean-Paul Gaultier released a collection that was both a logical extension and a radical departure from his usual body of work. Gaultier, in collaboration with the French Department of Treasury, produced a, Euro, a series of Euro coins called La France par Jean-Paul Gaultier, so Jean-Paul Gaultier's France in which he puts a whimsical spin on symbols of Frenchness. Here, for example, is his version of the Gallic rooster, dressed in an ensemble that you might recognize if you lived through the 90s or if you've heard of the 90s. The coin collection features 24 different regions of France, and it bears the hallmark of Gautier's signature style. There are muscle-bound men wearing striped sailor shirts and lithe, curvy women wearing corsets. In all of the images, there's a structural continuity between the human forms and the background scene. The aptly named Very Pointy Alps features a continuity between the body and the natural geography in the background. Royal Touraine also underscores the resemblance between the woman's figure and her surroundings, though it's, this time it's the architecture and not the natural landscape that provides the reference. In Volcanic Auvergne, he pushes the comparison further. 
So the boning and laces of the figure's boots and corset echo the metal trusses of the bridge in the background and the spokes of the tire in the foreground, connecting France's engineering innovation in steel, iron, and rubber to an ancient mythology of metal smithing with the reference to Vulcan. In Paris Capital, the Can Can Dancer's corset and skirt reprise the same geometric motif of the Moulin Rouge's rotor blades. Quaint burgundy features a more immediate relationship between the female figure and edifice. So women and architecture are one as the half timbering of the building's facade provides the structural material of the tower woman's corset. So while Gautier's images evoke the cultural variety and regional particularity found in France, the female figures featured all have the same basic shape. They are all cinched waist hourglasses, and they all exemplify the structural surroundings. This motif extends to the coin that he calls l'outre-mer étincelant, and this is his catch-all design for France's overseas territories. So in this homage to France's global territories, the women's headdress uh, and, the, and skirt mimic the palm fronds behind her. The corseted female torso that we've seen over and over again in the other coins uh, suggests that, though the geographical details may differ, the ideal shape of the French female body is universal. This is made explicit in the coin that's called Paris Universel. So here, Gautier features a curvaceous corseted Eiffel Tower against the backdrop of other marquee Parisian monuments. So from left to right, we have the Arc de Triomphe, Le Sacré-Cœur, and Notre-Dame de Paris. The name of the coin is a pun. So the Eiffel Tower was built for the Exposition Universelle in 1889, which is the World Fair. Uh, and the tower itself has since become a universal symbol for France. The same corset and cathedral appear on the coin that depicts Joan of Arc. Significantly, the androgyny of Marie, uh, excuse me, of uh, France's maiden savior with her short hair, armored body, and military posture is contrasted with the hyper-feminine curves of her exaggerated corset. What Gautier seems to suggest in this overlapping iconography is that the corset is as integral to France's cultural heritage as these human and topographical forms that signify French identity. What is unique about the Paris Universel coin, however, is that it is an edifice wearing a corset. It's not a woman. Given the exceptional nature of this image, is Gautier just suggesting that there is a more immediate conceptual connection between the corset and the Eiffel Tower? than between the corset and the other buildings or the other landscapes? Or is he just kind of combining random universal signifiers of Frenchness in this coin, Paris Universel? So today, I want to spend the rest of the time kind of interrogating the logic of Gautier's design by returning to the moment when the corset and the Eiffel Tower first coexisted, and it was at the 1889 Exposition Universelle the global event for which the tower was built and during which French corsets were on display. At the time of the exposition, both the Eiffel Tower and the corset were touted as products of French metallurgical and engineering ingenuity, though on vastly different scales. These skeletal structures also represented for many the triumph of the triumphant marriage of art and industry that uh, was the hallmark of French cultural and economic pr uh, production. So the imagery and materiality of Gautier's Paris Universel uh, define the theoretical framework of this presentation. So it's about the intersection of metal, fashion, and the female figure in fin de siècle France. 
So iron, in its sundry forms, is the unifying element of this analysis. So it is both the dominant metal in the building materials of the Eiffel Tower and in the steel boning and eyelets of 19th century corsets. And steel, of course, is an alloy of iron. So the structural similarities are compelling, but their intersection is enormously consequential when considered in, the, in terms of the biopolitical zeitgeist of Third Republic France. So this is a period when discussions about the corset's role in depopulation or a uh, plummeting birth rate dominated public discourse. So the first part of this presentation traces the role of iron in 19th century architectural and sartorial innovations and the influence of the Eiffel Tower on contemporary fashion. The second part demonstrates how the intersection of architecture and women's clothing connected to larger 19th century debates about the corset's role in France's depressed birth rate. And the final section of this paper examines the iconography of iron technology in cultural ephemera of late 19th century France, uh, including depictions of the Eiffel Tower, the corset, uh, a product called fer bravé, which is a liquid ferruginous treatment uh, for iron deficiency anemia. Uh, fer is the uh, French word for iron. And then uh, the display of heavy artillery at the Exposition Universelle in 1889. And finally, the uh, blood in iron, realpolitik of Prussia's iron chancellor, Otto von Bismarck. So iron thus constitutes the theoretical ossature of this, story, of this study. And it's the thematic commonality that unites the following uh, survey of disparate documents, essays about the Eiffel Tower, fashion plates, newspaper articles, illustrated guides of the 1889 Exposition Universelle, political discourses, and medical treatises. Taken together, these artifacts reveal the compelling node of fashion, fertility, and fer in late 19th century France. So Walter Benjamin uh, famously characterized the 19th century in France as another Iron Age of sorts. The rapid expansion of the railway in the pioneering use, uses of cast in wrought iron in architecture, uh, both as a structural support and as a decorative medium, made the element the metal of modernity. Considering the centrality of iron to 19th century industry and commerce, it comes as no surprise that the century's signature monument, the Eiffel Tower, was made of the same substance. So by now, the Eiffel Tower is so familiar to us that it is easy to forget what a Promethean feat of engineering it is. When it was completed, the 300-meter tower was the tallest man-made monument in the world, an accomplishment made even more impressive considering how little iron Eiffel may, used to make it. So Atish Bhatia puts it this way, if you took the Eiffel Tower and melted it down into a ball, the diameter of the resulting sphere would only measure 40 feet. So similarly, he says, if it were possible to create a cylinder large enough to cover the Eiffel Tower, the air in the cylinder would weigh more than the tower itself. So Eiffel achieved these new structural heights through a complex series of triangular trusses that allowed him to build the soaring monument with shockingly, at least for the time, little iron. Eiffel's innovative weight counterweight system constitutes what the engineer called the tower's metal ossature, ossature being another word for skeleton. So the reference to bones is not incidental. As Batia explains, the design of the Eiffel Tower was actually inspired by the design of the human femur. Eiffel based the design uh, of the tower's trust supports on mathematical models of trabeculae, or the crisscrossing fibers found in materials like bone and bamboo. And this crisscrossed configuration allows all of these materials to be both lightweight, 
but also very strong. So the fractalesque design of, the, of Eiffel's monument allowed the offset base to support the center mass of the tower in the same way that the human femur supports the torso. The Eiffel Tower's skeletal structure was, was only one of the consequential junctures of metal, bone, and body in 19th century France. The myriad thematic intersections between the Eiffel Tower and contemporary women's fashion uh, demonstrate the interrelation of these discourses. The tower itself was called the Iron Lady because the mesh structure between the four pillars resembled a skirt. Uh, the fashion industry capitalized on the excitement surrounding the tower by producing the tower, pardon, by producing fads that bore its name and likeness. So, for example, here the Eiffel Tower is the reference point for both the color and the weave of the material in two fashion plates from an, an 1890 issue of a fashion magazine called Modsham. Not everybody shared the fashion industry's enthusiasm for the Eiffel Tower. Uh, in fact, some of the century's most notable literary luminaries were among the tower's most ardent detractors. In his essay, On Iron, novelist uh, Joas Karl Wiesmans laments the ascendancy of iron as the preferred building material in the 19th century. He found the popular euphemisms for the tower it was called the Tower of Babel, Vulcan, Cyclops, the metal spider web, uh, iron lace. He found these euphemisms lacking. So he evocatively compares them uh, both to a carcass and a whole riddled suppository. Joining their voices with Wiesmann's in a chorus of protest, writers and artists like Charles Garnier who was the architect of the uh, Paris Opera, William Adolphe Bougreau, uh, Alexandre Dumas fils, and Guy de Maupassant identify themselves here as artists against the, the tower in an 1887 editorial in Le Temps. So the petition signatories condemn the tower's crash commercialism and, and warned that its realization could threaten Paris's credibility as an art capital and global tastemaker. They write, the Eiffel Tower is the dishonor of Paris. Even America, the commerce capital of the world, wouldn't want it. <laughs> Roland Barthes' classic essay on the Eiffel Tower begins with the claim that Maupassant, one of the signatories of this, uh, this editorial, that he liked to lunch at the restaurant at the bottom of the Eiffel Tower because it was the only place in the city where he didn't have to look at it. So despite his distaste for the Iron Monument and the vulgar teeming crowds that it attracted, Maupassant does recognize the political and economic importance of the 1889 Exposition Universelle. He says, I'll stop short of criticizing this, this colossal uh, enterprise, the World Fair, that showed the rest of the globe at the exact right moment the strength, vitality, productivity, and infinite richness that is this surprising country, France. So why was 1889 such a crucial time for France to show strength? As it coincided with the centennial of the 1789 revolution, the Exposition Universelle represented a benchmark against which the success of the Republican endeavor, endeavor could be measured. After a century of sustained political upheaval and armed conflict, France had finally entered its belle époque, so a period of relative calm and economic prosperity. So furthermore, given Maupassant's lexical choices, when he talks about the strength, the vitality, the productivity, it stands to reason that he was referring, at least in part, to the unfolding demographic disaster in Third Republic France. The low birth rates, which had never recovered after plummeting to unprecedented levels after the, the Franco-Prussian War in 1870 and 71, threatened the, the prospects of continued national prosperity. 
depopulation dominated political discourse and was an existential threat to the national vigor that Maupassant praises in his text. Historian Rachel Fuchs points to two major events at this time that accelerated panic about depopulation. So first was the crushing defeat of the Franco-Prussian War, but also second, in the census of 1891, it became apparent that in the five previous years, there had been more deaths than births in France. These factors, combined with a high infant mortality rate at the end of the century, rendered depopulation the most pressing of political priorities. The population of Prussia had outpaced that of France within the same time period by a factor of four. This pretended calamity for the French nation. So while demographers have demonstrated that birth rates are highly complex phenomena with many, many interrelated dynamics, a contingent of dress reformers and pu public health officials increasingly focused their natalist fervor on one thing, the corset. For its critics, the corset was a weapon of mass demographic destruction because it compromised fetal bodies by exerting undue pressure on the maternal belly. According to this reasoning, one of the structures had to give. The pregnant women could comply with the corset's unyielding compression and compromise the children they were carrying in utero, or they could forsake the corset and allow both their bellies and their babies to develop naturally. So <clears throat> Eiffel constructed his tower during a period of intense debate about the harmful consequences that corsets inflicted on the female figure. So by 1889, all of the novelty corsets inspired by the Eiffel Tower had something else in common with the monument. They all had iron in them. By this time, the whalebone that had traditionally been used to stiffen the corsets had given way to steel boning. Steel, again, being an alloy of iron. Metal boning still provided support, but was more flexible and more durable than its organic predecessor. So this same human skeleton that inspired Eiffel's Iron Tower was also what was being shaped by the metal architecture of late 19th century corsets. And though designers touted steel stays as a more salubrious alternative to the whalebone, the same metal that provided more flexibility in the corset's body also made the practice of tight lacing possible. The introduction of metal eyelets into the construction of the corset in 1828 facilitated tight lacing because unlike fabric reinforced eye holes, these eyelets did not tear when the laces were pulled very tightly. The steel found in fin de siècle corsets thus accommodated the paradoxical movements of both expansion and retraction. So it promised women more flexibility, but it also rendered the wasp waist achievable for the most devoted of tight lacers. But could underwear really be a serious existential threat to France's future? Well, for these dress reformers and public health officials, who were panicked about depopulation, yes. The extreme waist cinching that could be achieved with steel reinforced corsets represented an existential threat of the highest order. So by the time of the World Fair in 1889, the anti-corset coalition had spent decades sounding the alarm about its potential for abuse. The specter of national annihilation haunts their rhetoric. For these reformers and health officials, anything that endangered the integrity of the fetal body threatened France's future line of defense. In his doctoral thesis on the corset, Paul Vesset makes the stark prediction that unless uh, society rejected, the, rejected wholesale the practice of tight lacing, both men and women would soon be incapable of fulfilling their respective obligations to the country and to their families. In other words, the corset will have made them too weak to be the healthy soldiers and fertile mothers that the nation needed. 
The corset industry tried to deflect this kind of catastrophizing rhetoric by insisting that the integration of metal structures into its design actually made the corset healthy. The publication Beauté Corset, for example, insists that the corset was no longer a prison, but a lovely retirement home, <laughs> employing the same corset as architecture motif that Gautier reprises in his Euros. So Beauté Corset was a trade magazine, so hardly a disinterested party uh, in this debate. But the rhetoric found within the pages is representative of the dominant cultural discourse surrounding the corset. As David Kunzel has explained, dress reform movements in France faced a significant resistance, uh, especially compared to its European neighbors, because it relied so heavily on the capital generated by the fashion industry. So in order to navigate these conflicted natalist and capitalist imperatives, many opted for the half measure of reform. Fashion trade magazines were only one of the many popular press forums for the corset debate. So a cartoon uh, in an 1891 edition of Albert Robida's La Caricature uh, proposes an ingenious solution to the fashion-induced depopulation problem. So you see a Parisian shop girl and a female client, both with extremely cinched waist, uh, standing in front of a boutique counter. When the client expresses disbelief that a new kind of crinoline might be coming back into style, the shop girl extols the fad's potential uh, virtues. She says, they're even talking about putting the bustle on the front to encourage natality. Because at this time, the uh, pregnant female body, no matter what the marital condition of the woman, marital situation of the woman, uh, was considered indecent. So if women could not be convinced to forsake the corset for the health of their babies, the artist suggests, perhaps they could be persuaded to adopt another fashionable silhouette that would not endanger their pregnancies. So despite its humorous tone, this image nonetheless shows how implicated uh, structured undergarments were in the serious discussion about depopulation and how formidable a foe the corset was to natality. So in other words, for many in the medical community, the corset was not irredeemable, but it had to be worn responsibly. Superior taste and technique, the traditional purview of the French, were integral to the process. Fashion historian Valerie Steele, convenient, right, has explained that the corset making industry offered major financial incentives to doctors who were willing to endorse a more hygienic version of the corset. So this practice meant that women received mixed messages from the medical community. And because of this contradiction, the corset became the point of contact between these conflicting discourses of both degeneration and progress. For the most, anti the most ardent anti-corset activists, making a more hygienic corset was tantamount to making a healthier cigarette. Right? It was an absurd task because it was uh, inherently and irredeemably harmful no matter how flexible the new boning was or how technologically advanced the course it claimed to be. The discourses of iron, natality, and national security converge in the medical advertisements for Fer Brave, the marquee product of pharmacist Raoul Brave. So the eponymous tonic was a ferruginous treatment for iron deficiency anemia a condition commonly associated with menstruation, pregnancy, and corset wearing. The images printed on these pharmaceutical trade cards make clear the importance of combating anemia. With their references to child and maternal health and military engagement, these trading cards suggest that the failure to address the scourge of anemia will invariably lead to a diminished demographic and ultimately to the end of France as we know it. So the most well-known of these images is André Léon uh, Willette's 1895 lithograph featuring a young blonde seamstress slumped over at her sewing machine. Her posture is as plastic as the Eiffel Tower behind her is rigid. 
The fluid font of the words l'anemi reflect the relaxed disposition of her languid body, while the rectilinear typeface of the words le faire bravé suggests strength and mirrors the similarly geometric form of the tower. Though she is beautiful, the anemic young woman literally pales in comparison to the reddish hues of the flowers, bricks, bobbin thread, and lettering in the image. The absence of any warm tones in her skin indicates the iron deficient blood running through her vessels. So the fact that she's a seamstress is not incidental. Her blue corset occupies the center of the image and gestures to the origin of her condition. Because of the public health efforts of contemporary dress reformers and medical authorities, the correlation between the woman's corset and her weakened condition would have been immediately legible for a fin de siècle pu public. The interrelation of the corset and the anemic woman is reinforced by the birdcage and the lampshade in the upper right, uh, excuse me, upper and lower left-hand corners. The vertical metal bars of the birdcage recall the steel stays of contemporary corsets. So the picture suggests that these metal structures inhibit the organic life, life forms that they contain, a yellow bird and a blonde woman, respectively. Furthermore, the severe curve of the lampshade on the young woman's desk connects vertically to the birdcage and recalls the cinched waist of the image's main subject. The confluence of this imagery demonstrates that these restrictive apparatuses sap the vitality of both fowl and female, as further evidenced by the fact that the young woman has dropped her scissors. Anemia drains labor and productivity of their vitality. However, the menace of economic underperformance is by far the lesser threat implied in this image. The subject is a young, beautiful woman of childbearing age. The faint suggestion of a wedding ring on her left hand indicates that she is in the preferred social position to produce many healthy children for France. However, obstacles to ideal maternity crowd the frame the woman's anemia promises to complicate her fertility and any potential for healthy fetal development. As the cause of her anemia, or at least as the cause according to 19th century medicine, the tight-laced corset and the woman, excuse me, renders the woman weak and through severe abdominal constriction threatens to compromise any potential pre pregnancy. So undercutting the stability symbolized by the ring, the cat perched on the desk uh, visually signals a sexual permissiveness that had long been associated both with the animal and with the profession of the woman. So in promising restored vitality for anemic young women, Fer Brave proposes to bridge the gap between fertility and fashion. The implications of Fer Brave for fertility become even more evident when Willette's image is considered with similar advertisements featuring children. Valerie Steele has proposed that the corset companies often used cherubs in their marketing, marketing materials as a way to subliminally assure women that their specific variation on the corset would in no way threaten their pregnancies or the health of their babies. So this trade card series makes a similar implicit promise. Right? The children found on these cards are quite literally the picture of health. So here are two cherubic, apple-cheeked youngsters as they huddle under an expansive umbrella. And they say, the rain can soak us, but we're not afraid. The umbrella displays a deep crimson hue, the same color as the blood enriched by Fer Brave is. And the tonic renders the children impervious to sickness caused by rain, wind, or snow. The dog sitting next to the children exudes a warm fidelity. And the canine companion forms with the umbrella and with Fer Brave a protective triad that shields the young ones from harm. 
The following image shows that though the seasons may change, the hallmarks of childhood health are the same. Rosy cheeks and ruby lips mark the faces of the second set of children. The girl's red striped dress, referenced again by the color of the vessel-like coral in the foreground, calls to mind the oxygenated, ferruginous blood that Fabravé promises its clients. The pattern of the dress indicates the robust circulation of iron-rich blood flowing through her vascular system. The third image in this series portrays a child dressed as a soldier. So like the energetic children at the seashore, this boy, outfitted in Republican blue, white, and red, lauds Fabrave for giving him the strength and the energy he needs to perform his daily activities. He says, I can do all of my exercises without getting tired. Thanks, Fabrave. Like his counterparts on the other card, this boy is healthy and resilient and goes about his busy day unfettered by fatigue. And though he is only playing dress up, right, his wooden horse and his fer, so fer means iron, but it's also a, a way to say sword in French, his saber, uh, his fer is bulb tipped for safety. The implications are clear. This boy will one day become the man he is now pretending to be, and that man will one day be needed to defend France from her enemies. The image of the boy is, is a compelling counterpart to an 1870 caricature of Otto von Bismarck. So in, in an image called, Here's Bismarck Again, the Iron Chancellor sweeps his unwilling countrymen with this giant broom under his aegis of German unification. So this, this is a, hardly a flattering portrait of Bismarck. Um, in the caption, he says he's gathering an army out of fear that the French will steal all of his sauerkraut. Um, it nonetheless reads as a serious menace, especially considering the eventuality of the Franco-Prussian War. The hordes of troops depicted in the image gesture to a rapidly reproducing Prussia that, through sheer strength of numbers, would be impossible to overcome. The eventuality of armed conflict is realized in this trade card image, though like the others, this pharmaceutical card was produced during the Third Republic. It, it references a moment of military mythology from the July monarchy, which is at, uh, in the first half of the century. Amidst a hail of artillery and gunfire, Captain Saint-Arnaud, who is the center figure, uh, he's clothed in harem pants in the, in the colors of Republican France. He leads his men into the breach and says, it's nothing, it's only gunfire. Forward march. So Saint Arnaud's interjection proved so motivating to his men that they were able to penetrate the barricade and against all odds overtake the enemy in this Battle of Constantinople. The alignment of Fabravi with this captain, Saint Arnaud, suggests that the, that the tonic was essential, uh, was essentially bravery in a bottle. It was the necessary ingredient for turning young boys into fearless defenders of the nation. So the word mitraille here contains a lexical richness that the card fully exploits. So mitraille most obviously references the hail of bullets and cannonballs depicted in the image but it can also be translated as shrapnel, um, which is an efficient but decidedly more violent way to increase iron levels in the bloodstream. Um, lastly, mitraille can also be translated as loose change. And so it puts a moral question to potential purchasers in economic terms. So considering the affordability of the tonic and recognizing the vital role of the military in France's future viability, could the consumer really afford not to buy Fair Brave? Ce n'est que de la mitraille. So to conclude, we return to the 1889 Exposition Universelle in a final instantiation of iron technology produced, uh, in, announced in the introduction. Iron cannons. Philippe Daril, a writer who contributed columns to a collaborative volume covering the fair, describes this heavy artillery in a column devoted to what struck him as a shocking juxtaposition of exhibits. It's called Baby Clothes and Cannons. Daryl 
uh, catalogs the sundry objects gathered by the Public Welfare Office for the exhibit, including infant clothes, bottles, toys, and strollers. He is moved by the artifacts on display, which inspire him to ponder the intensive labor that goes into raising a child. They show us how difficult it is to raise a human being, he says, how much it costs, how much care, worry, and investment of every kind that a full-grown adult represents. So though he expresses great admiration for the powerful and sophisticated weapons on display, he is confounded. Why would organizers exhibit baby clothes next to heavy artillery? So for him, this is a misfire in an otherwise masterfully orchestrated event. But he says, whether we like it or not, the gaping maws of the iron cannons shock us as a discordant note in a symphony of labor. What? Is this the last cry of this beautiful civilization? Was it necessary to remind us that it was hanging by a thread to confront us with the vanitas of this world and poison our happiness with this memento mori? So to answer Daryl's question, I would argue that Third Republic politicians, demographers, and dress reformers were the ones who originally put these two things together. The side-by-side -side exhibit of baby clothes and cannonry was the physical manifestation of an intersection that was already happening in public discourse. Given its central role in the depopulation debate, I would offer that the corset is the conceptual midpoint between baby clothes and the weapons of war on display. The memento mori motif that Daryl references resonates powerfully in Dr. Ludovic O'Followell's 1908 uh, medical treatise, The Corset. Nascent X-ray technology allowed all to see what the corset was actually doing to the viscera and bones of French women. What is also captivating about these images is the way that the corset's lacing and, and own metallic ossature create a visual continuity between metal and bone in triangular patterns that recall the elaborate support trusses of the Eiffel Tower. So given what we know about how the corset intersected with pregnancy, it might be more appropriate to label these images not memento mori, remember that you are dying, but memento nashi, remember that you are being born. A reminder of the inevitability of birth and the importance of an uncompromised maternal body. Was it so necessary to remind us that French civilization is hanging by a thread, Daryl wonders. Who could have imagined that the thread he was talking about was the lacing of a corset? Thanks. Merci, Dr. Phoenix. That was phenomenal. <laughs> You're welcome to stand there. You can do whatever you'd like. Um, we are so grateful for the time that it took for you to come and speak with us. That was truly fascinating. Um, through Dr. Phoenix's, Phoenix's research, we can see the eerie parallel that metal imageries of corsets and French architecture have on women's lives today. We have always been dealing with rigid body issues, restrictions on our bodies, and the highly complicated politics of reproduction and fashion. It happened with the unyielding nature of French corsets and expectations in the 18th century, and it is happening now in 2023. This phenomenal research shows that we need to respect the complexity of the terms we use to describe women and women's issues. When we view problems, especially ones like fashion and reproductive health with a black and white iron frame, we tend to confuse cause and effect and we end up destroying the complexity that encircles these. When items like um, corsets become the scapegoats for controlling women, we must stand up and reject these notions. We need to stand up for women everywhere and consider our own killer corsets in our lives. What can we challenge? What can we improve? How do we fix the gaping iron maws in our own lives? Dr. Sarah Phoenix proves that we need to take, we need not take a say la vie approach to heavy metal issues. We can take a stand and speak up. Thank you. I will now turn the time over to Katie for our Q&A portion. Yeah. We again have the honor to hear from Dr. Phoenix with specific questions for her extensive research. Uh, we will have questions specifically from the chat that are monitored or from ladies and gentlemen who want to come over here and ask questions. I'll start off first by um, asking about what you had addressed in the beginning, um, especially with that beautiful image of Annabelle where you had said the monsters that beautiful things create. And I'd love to see um, how you think that still relates today and I'd love to see how you believe the, the corset still exists for women today, whether that be still with underwire bras or even the idea of the corset 
still emerging in modern fashion, and how has France helped with that influence today? Yes. Um, thank you for both that response and that excellent question. So what, uh, how Valerie, we, we have Shapewear now, right, which is very, performs a very similar function. But what uh, Valerie Steele, uh, the, the fashion historian who wrote the book called The Corset, A Cultural History, World War I actually puts an end to the corset because the steel boning that was needed for the production was uh, needed to supply the war machine. So these intersections of like national security and women's fashion just kind of never, they proliferate. Um, and everyone, people tend to look at the corset as this extremely restrictive uh, garment. It had a lot of uh, advantages for the women who wore it, but it was really the what the, the medical uh, officials called the abuses of the corset that were so problematic. So a corset cannot actually deform a fetus right, if it's tied too tightly. That's not possible. It will crush the woman's internal organs before it ever deforms the fetus. Um, but that doesn't mean that people in the 19th century didn't believe that and, and with uh, a lot of conviction. But what Valerie Steele says is in this tra uh, transition away from the corset in 1920, um, that something no less oppressive took its place and its thinness. So what you could achieve with a little bit of help from this garment that you put around your midsection it was now an expectation that you somehow, uh, through deprivation, uh, you mold your own body, right? So you still need this silhouette, and the silhouette changes, right? In, in the post-war era, it's a very straight up and down. It's no longer the, the hourglass, but the hourglass comes back with a vengeance. Um, but... The, she says essentially the, the cult of thinness and now plastic surgery has replaced the corset. So women are no less free from the kinds of expectations right, that, that we're talking about. It's just the uh, kind of the, the torture devices have evolved a little bit over the years. Hi, Sophie. I don't think that's on. OK. <laughs> so my question is in regards to a current trend that we've been seeing on social media, where women have started wearing the corset again as a symbol of like liberty, as a symbol of choice, and it's something that they actually want to do. How does that connect to your research and what you've seen in the trends with the corset in the past? <sighs> It is such a complicated question. There are a lot of parallels with the debate about the um, Muslim veil in France. Right? Is this inherently a symbol of oppression, right? Or is it more complicated than that? And is uh, an element of agency, right, needed? Do we need to acknowledge that in order to uh, lend the question the complexity that it deserves? So. It depends on the context, right? And I think you can make a very powerful argument with completely different uh, conclusions, but it really depends on where it's coming from and what is, uh, what is motivating the practice. So it's inherently, it's extremely, extremely complicated, and that's why it's impossible to say the course, it was just this oppressive torture device, right? That's how the many in the medical profession saw it. But also, there was a lot of money to be made uh, from the doctors who said, "Yes, it's a torture device, but this one is right. This one will will help you have healthy babies." Yeah, thank you. Great question. Thanks. We have another question in the chat from Valeria Valentini. It says, women have been associated to the Eiffel Tower. As you mentioned, metal fashion female figure. 
Because the similarities shown in the PowerPoint, women's figures seem to be compared to an object. Would you say that this perpetuated the objectification of women in French history? Yes, but in a new creative way. <laughs> I, yeah. I, the the Eiffel Tower is also not an obvious, um, has not always been talked about as an obvious female symbol either, right? There are arguments to be made that it's an obvious male symbol. Um, and it overtook actually in height the Washington Monument, right? By the time that was their, their claim uh, to fame at that point. But again, like I would say to, to Sophie's question, it you really have to acknowledge the complexity that surrounds all of these questions, and especially when, when these discourses intersect, that multiplies the complexity. It doesn't simplify it in any kind of way. Is that our time? Une question de plus. Okay. Go for it, Eleanor. I guess, do you have any final words about how, like, expectations for women or love, like, having babies are often at odds with, like, what people want from pe women's bodies, like, postpartum bodies, kind of like a, men are like, eh. Even women are like, eh. But, like, it's an expectation <laughs> that you have babies. So... Yeah, it, that is a great question, and it's and something actually we we are we should feel very compelled to pay attention to within our own very specific culture, is when we see billboards on along I-15 between here and Salt Lake uh, advertising the mommy makeover, that kind of suite of um, plastic surgery device uh, operations that make you return you to a pre-maternal body. Um, there's just a very powerful spiritual corollary there, and that attitude to the female body, to any human body, in the maternal body, is just idolatry in its purest form. Right? You're mistaking the object for what, uh, and you're replacing its materiality with what its higher purpose is supposed to be. Great question. Well, thanks, everyone.